Okay, wonderful. Well, let's get started right away. Um, so I'm going to introduce Dr. Betancourt. Um, he actually is very well respected by our community here. He was, um, you know, part, I guess, of the think tank to help start COSP up originally and was called in to help with the emergence of our program. Um, he hails from the University of Chicago, where he's the inaugural director of the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation. He's also a professor of ecology and evolution, and he's associate faculty in the Department of Sociology. And he's also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. His research is an interdisciplinary effort between complex adaptive systems in biology and society. His research focus is on the identification, modeling, and theory of the, of the systemic processes and properties that create and sustain cities. He has a new book, which is entitled Introduction to Urban Science, published by MIT Press in 2021. And this book provides an interdisciplinary synthesis of these ideas and a vision for the future of cities. So with that, I'll allow Dr. Benton Court to describe more about what he's going to talk about today. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everybody, for, um, for welcoming me uh, back to CUSP. Uh, I was just reminiscing a little bit with, with, with Jackie and Harris that uh, it felt to me like I was there in the very beginning. Uh, Steve Kuhn in the old offices and Constantine was uh, mostly the person standing up the masters. And uh, we were talking also about uh, Michael Batty and Jeff West and Azelobo, a bunch of other people we knew. We all got called to give some of the first lectures. So it was kind of a fun moment that I recall and I remember fondly. So I can't wait to visit again and see. Uh, I'm sure you're all grown up now. And it's a different organization, but it was a good time. And I did something a little bit subversive. So when you invite me, you got to be careful. I, um, I, I, you know, New York has so many interesting moments in urban history, of course. Uh, but I, I called Mary Rowe, who was then the head of, of the MAS, to, uh, um, to, uh, to, to play and comment on, on the movie by, um, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the life of uh, small urban spaces, right, by, uh, by White. And so that was kind of an early sort of cusp moment of how do you study the cities and censors. So with that said, I, I'm going to go through a, a talk as usual. I'm going to bring up my slides and uh, I'll comment a little bit on these things as we go. So uh, let me know if these are visible. Let's see. It look good? Okay, fantastic. So um, so today I'll just, we'll spend a little bit of time in the introduction, I think, talk a little bit about what I think is the state of urban science. I'd like to convince you, I know you're a diverse audience, but I'd like to convince you that we have an emerging sort of framework to study cities in ways that are predictive, they're sort of use scientific methods, but also different from other sciences. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time drawing those differences, but in some sense, uh, I, I think it's a very interesting time by which uh, studying cities is allowing us to create sort of interdisciplinary uh, science that's more uh, collaborative across scales, but it's also of a somewhat new thing with new properties. And it's really uh, because of, you know, a lot of work uh, from very diverse people working in the field that this is becoming possible. And then I spent two, a little bit of time onto uh, applications that have big data sets and that use sort of ideas of the framework of urban science, but also expose when some of these ideas get more complicated and when we have opportunity to, to study important, difficult situations in terms of both urban development and in some sense spatial planning. So in the way of introduction, Jackie already uh, said a little bit about what I do, but um, I'm now the director from about four, four and a half years uh, in a parallel sort of effort to CUSP in some ways. We have an institute at the University of Chicago dedicated to cities called the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation. I was hired here to be the director. And so uh, we're a little bit different from CUSP in that um, we're mostly dedicated to, uh, uh, um, we don't have a master's, that's the biggest difference. And we mostly dedicated, the University of Chicago being what it is, uh, to, uh, to sort of unifying conceptual ideas across disciplines with a strong emphasis on social sciences but also use, uh, like you, new methods of data and so on to understand sort of, as we say here, the fundamental process that drive, shape, and sustain cities. So we're a little bit in the area of applications and practice. We're a little bit less in the area of policy because there's a certain division of labor here within uh, the, the university and we have many events and so forth. So you're welcome to join some of our events now that we can do it on Zoom. And the link is there below. 
And this is the book that Jackie mentioned. I will use the book a little bit for, the book is quite long. <laughs> it's about 450 pages. So I spent a lot of time trying to explain what I think is the state of urban science and the many things you can understand and predict. Uh, and I'll use a little bit of that. I'll use this sort of uh, pink color to, to direct you to some parts of the book. If you're interested in some of the things I'm gonna say quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, it's my attempt to kind of summarize where we are, but also many of the things that are wonderful about urban science and cities that we can now understand conceptually and that we have to continue to improve on, uh, um, you know, the way we describe them. And this is, of course, the work of many people here, some of the more important for the things I'll say today. But uh, as always, uh, you know, the errors are mine, but uh, the inspiration is always collective. Uh, I'll mention some of their names uh, around some of the things in more detail as I go. So just to situate us, <clears throat> the last 20 years have been extraordinary, right? In the sense of not only uh, a time of fast global urbanization, and when we talk about global, we're really talking about Asia and Africa. These are the places where population growth to some extent, but also urbanization has been very fast, creating complete you know, structural transformations, a place like China, or before them, Korea and so on, and many other places, now India. But also uh, it's a time of technological change that allows a lot of what we do uh, as, as specific kind of uh, research possible. So it's the fact that we're creating a lot of data. Some of it uh, is, is traditional, and it became easier to create, but some of it is also from uh, digital devices, sensors, satellites, and a bunch of other things. So we are awash in some sense in data. And we need frameworks to understand how to use this data. And some of these frameworks are somewhat practical, more to uh, how do you run a city sort of on an everyday basis that's closer a little bit to the idea of urban analytics. And some of them are a little bit more fundamental. These ideas go interplay you know, with each other in terms of, you know, can we fundamentally understand why cities exist, why they look the way they are? Can we have theory that extrapolates to new situations? So it's really a, a very rich environment in which we can uh, start to uh, both understand fundamentally what's general about cities and then act uh, in, in detail. And so much of the effort, the way I've been involved in is an effort uh, about current cities all over the world. And I'll give you a flavor of that quickly, uh, but it's also uh, an effort throughout history we, uh, with collaborators that you saw in the previous slide in, in, in history and in archeology, span we've been pushing this as far back to every urban system for which we can have data. Now we have new methods so we can reanalyze some, a lot of this data. And so there are a lot of patterns in history in contexts that are very different from modern contexts in which we can also understand how these cities worked and test whether they have empirical patterns that are similar to what we have come to expect, but also see when they break. And of course, uh, on the table, what's most important, and it's important also in New York, I'll say something just at the very end. Uh, we want to be able to not just study cities as we see them every day, as we measure them every day, as we in some sense see them through data, we want to extrapolate to new situations where the data that we have is not good enough, where we need to have analytical frameworks that take us into the future. This is what really theory and science is for, is not just to manage everyday situations, is to take us to entirely new situations, sort of the paradigm being sort of sustainable cities, right? Which means many different things in terms of equity, in terms of continued prosperity, but in different forms, and also in terms of our interactions with the environment that will lead to very important structural transformations but perhaps can maintain uh, the essence of what cities do well. Okay, so in my talk, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize in general terms is that uh, what I'm gonna say, at least in this first part, has to do with looking at cities all the way from early settlements to uh, cities in history to present cities, of course, where we spend most of our time, but also to try to imagine what future cities can be. And I'm not gonna be talking really about uh, any of the things on the right, technology, political systems, economic systems, urban planning, as the fundamental things that we do. So I'm going to cross them out. <laughs> okay, so don't freak you out yet. And what I'm going to say is that we need to understand cities a bit more fundamentally if we want to have a theory with a scope. And so I'm going to use, borrow this, this expression from economists in terms of micro foundations. They're a little bit deeper than some of these practices. And what I'm going to use and what I'm going to claim is general about uh, any theory of cities is that it's based on understanding networks of heterogeneous agents that have different costs and benefits, depending who they are and what they know and what stage of life they are and so forth. And there's a very important quantity that's basically information that people are learning and there's information in structure in the way cities are put together and that together these three perspectives, these three quantities. So basically, if you want to think like a physicist or a natural scientist, 
The second one is about energy management or resource management. The last one's about information. These are the two main quantities that any theory needs to have. And the first one is about how these things are connected. And cities are really places of connectivity that promote a different dynamics uh, of both energy and information and create in some sense change. So these are generative principles and, uh, and kind of open up a lot of connections to traditional disciplines, but also force us to do something new. So what we want to do is talk about these things but from this generative point of view. And you'll see that I'll try to do that a little bit. Okay, so uh, I have a bunch of slides here just to motivate us. This is New York City is where you live. It's just a little clip showing how complicated life is. This is a bit of a tip of the hat to someone like, like Jane Jacobs who tried to understand cities this way. But again, this is about connections. All these people are interacting with each other. Connections are not friendships. They're just all the crazy things we do together. They're about information. It's pretty obvious what information is here, but there's information in patterns of behavior. There's information in signals that are intentional, there's information in all kinds of other things, in the language and things that people are planning to do. And there's, of course, a cost benefit. You live in New York, you know it's expensive. But one of the things that's been always difficult for people that study cities to actually get to is what is the benefit? You know, <laughs> if you ask people, for example, a place like Chicago, you know, why do you live in Chicago? Is it the crime? Is it the potholes? Is that the climate? I'm not putting this on New York, but you can translate to New York. The people really struggle to say why you live in a place like this. But the benefit is obvious, right? And has to be, it's a bit like measuring gravity or something. We don't measure it directly, we measure its effects. So, but we want to capture in the theory of cities all the stuff right, and have a way to sometimes average it out and sometimes kind of deal with it at more detail. So this is uh, in the spirit of Jane Jacobs, just a quote from the life and death, death and life, of that these processes are before us, we can measure them better and better, they're not difficult, people live in these environments, they actually understand them at an intuitive level, but we've not come to put them together in terms of analysis, analytics, if you will, and also sort of systemic knowledge like science. So this is sort of the, the exercise. And what drives me particularly is this kind of thing, which is on a different time scale, but that's unique to cities. We don't know how to do this without cities, which is these amazing transformations. So this is Shanghai, it's 25 years, and I'm interested. I came to cities, not because of cities themselves, but because they promote uh, change, change that's very quick and, uh, and that can change the world and the way people live, right? Okay. so. In this talk, I'll tell you a little bit about urban science, then I'll get into these two applications that have to do with human development in human cities, in US cities, sorry, and neighborhoods. So how do we measure it, which is an extension of international measurements, but that starts revealing scales of organization in cities and how cities actually are engines or can be engines of human development. And I want to also talk about informality and sustainable development in cities that are forming now particularly in Africa, where we have extraordinary new data sets that completely change the game, uh, how we may think about planning and making them sustainable. So I'm going to go through this first part relatively quickly. It's the stuff I do most, and that's what is uh, a lot in the book and many of the papers, uh, just to situate us and then give us a frame to discuss the two applications. But the first thing I want to say is that if you think about what are cities, right? If you just ask the question, somehow it's always difficult, right, to answer. But my answer, sort of the essential answer, the simplest answer, the minimal answer, is that there are many things, right? But all these things basically need to be put together. So Jane Jacobs called it organized complexity. So an idea was Warren Weavers, and that was all ideas that were developed sort of in the context of New York City. But these are early theories of complex systems. And like me, Mike Batty, we have somewhat different dialects, but we all see cities as complex systems very much in the spirit of all these authors and many important planners and urbanists. But now again, we can turn this into quantitative theory and, and, um, and uh, science, if you will. Okay. So the essence of cities to start answering these questions is that they are essentially complex networks, at least structurally. And these are complex networks of two things. And these two things are, have to be put together. It's in putting them together that actually you get a city. So first, obviously, it's a, it, there are networks of people, right? We interact with each other to get anything in New York. You need to deal with people and organizations. And the socioeconomic network of the city is really what makes it special. It's the fact that you can go to uh, Manhattan or Brooklyn, and in principle, you have a world of possibilities before you and that you explore these possibilities through interaction with other people, uh, direct or indirect now with COVID. Uh, and this is really what a city is. Even the cities that are poor or in history that don't have a lot of infrastructure, they still concentrate and accelerate uh, 
um, social economic networks. Now, modern cities and cities that they develop, they also develop sort of a self-consistent organization of built space. And this is a famous Noli map of Rome, which is the first map that was uh, has this feature where the public spaces and the private spaces are in black and white. So this is kind of something you see now in other maps. But this shows you that a city is both a private space where people live and sometimes work, but it's a space of interaction and flow. And these spaces have to be organized just in the right way, such that the cost benefit that they impose on people, which you know are, 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 are relatively large, are commensurate with the advantages that you get from interaction. So this is kind of the magic of cities. I'm saying it in words, I'm gonna to try to show you very quickly what this means in terms of effects and just the little model that gets you there and the rest, you have to work a little harder with math. But this is basically the essence of cities is what, what they are as, as functional processes that then lead to visible parts of organization. And so, and what this enables, which is even harder, the benefit, if you will, is that so they are about connectivity and a lot of issues of equity and poverty have a lot to do with lack of connectivity, which uh, also implies lack of opportunity and a bunch of other deficits. But then these connections allow and force, in fact, people to learn and adapt. And out of that learning and adaptation, which is of many forms, many of the things on the right here, I'm not going to spend time describing come out of, including uh, development and growth including economic growth. So this is still an area that we don't understand very well how to put all the pieces together from the person to the city and beyond. But this is basically a lot of the agenda of, uh, of urban science is connecting these scales. So there are many of these properties that become properties of cities. They saw in that little clip that people are different. They do different things. They come from different places. They like different food. And this has always been a problem for planners. Is this a bug or a feature? How should you sustain diversity, which of course is good, and minimize inequality, which of course is bad. Um, this property of interconnectivity is very important. It's expressed in many different ways. Again, you'll see that there are scaling properties where large cities emphasize certain things more than um, smaller cities. So smaller cities are more about energy and resources. Larger cities are about more about information. And this is expressed in their socioeconomic networks and their diversity patterns. And then there's a lot of circular causalities as a system to a lot of feedback. So this makes a lot of the early models, classical models from geography and economics not work very well. I think you see that in analytics, but uh, this is where sort of the complex systems uh, really shines. And there's then a process of development and evolution that creates things like economic growth, but also other forms of development, learning to adapt to COVID and so forth, which is sort of the most important thing that cities do. So a lot of this only emerges at the urban scale. It doesn't exist for people. It doesn't exist for neighborhoods. So you have to go to certain scales to get some of these effects. And so I'm going to go a little bit more quickly about this through this. This was basically the idea of the complexities and how we organize all these things in the city. And that uh, in some sense, we ask now to do person-centric planning and practice. And this means that essentially this network of complex functions need to uh, exist and work for different people. But this is the idea I was talking about, which is essentially to understand cities sort of on the whole, right? You need to understand many different scales of analysis and understand how they're interconnected. So this is basically the program is that we need to deal with more sophisticated agents. We don't obviously not gonna describe people in all their detail with all their uh, life history, but we need to think about them as being heterogeneous, as having agency, as having being capable of learning. Uh, and how much you need of that, depending on the phenomenon that you're looking at. There's the skill of neighborhoods, which is very important for things like equity and inequality. A lot of sociology, certainly here in Chicago, is about that scale. And I think you also, some of you, spend a lot of time thinking about that scale. That skill is an intermediate scale. It cannot be really understood uh, without reference to the scales above and below. Uh, then the city as this network that I already referred to creates agglomerations and scaling effects that really creates sort of the magic of cities. So you have to go to that scale to understand why cities even exist. And then there are problems that have to do the more classical in geography that probably Mike talk a little bit about, Mike Batty, that have to do with the structure of the urban system, so the system of cities, and then how that generates some issues like sustainability and uh, global flows of resources and so on. So those, I'm not gonna talk about these larger scales. I'm gonna concentrate mostly on the scale of neighborhoods and cities as examples. But as a program, all these scales are sort of related and they bring in new phenomena that need to be taken into account in order to understand cities. And we now have theories of all these scales that are interconnected and they're quantitative and so on. Okay, so 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about scaling because this is how I came into the field. And it's a very interesting phenomenon. I think you all know about it. It's an average phenomenon for cities. So it's a property of the network of the metropolitan area of New York and Chicago and every other city as a whole. So the city and its suburbs together. So uh, economists like to call this a unified labor market. So all the people that live and work within a city. So what when you look at these networks, they express essentially the essence of these networks is that they express network effects, right? Something that we learned from the web, that the value of these networks is not the number of people in them. It has to do with the number of connections. These connections are the things that have value. If they're there, they express some relationship that's valuable. Again, this is an indirect inference. You can go and measure it now with cell phones and other things. But the idea is that um, somehow this must be what cities are about. And the theory of this predicts a lot of these effects. So you see all kinds of interesting things that uh, if, if you know networks, and I think if, if you know the basic, right, any graph, that the number of connections can be can be nonlinear, can be uh, superlinear, have an exponent typically two uh, n square on the number of nodes. So this sort of effect, which is true of every network, has a special particular instance, instantiation in cities that's mediated through the structure of built space and the costs of moving around. And it creates these curious effects that when we started looking at data, it's just they just come out again and again and again. So this is an early study from the 70s that the economic productivity, this is the profits of companies uh, per capita increases by about 15%. If you look at a city and a city that's double its size, this is sort of an average result. This is for crime uh, paper a long ago by a Glazer at, at Harvard who was looking at crime. So crime also increases per capita. New York has been doing a little bit better, but you know now, now uh, challenging times. Chicago does poorly, but on the average, there's this effect that uh, as you as you uh, see a larger uh, city uh, double the size of another, that crime per capita goes up and the effect is about 15, between 10 and 20%. And this is the earliest slide I did uh, with, with my friend Jose Lobo, and it was about wages, as you can see here. So it's a little fuzzy, I'm sorry, but I, it has emotional value for me. And it's basically about wages in, in US cities and the exponent is about 1.12, so it's more like 12%. But you, what you can see here is this is why I hope you, you make the commensurate salary in New York City. So you should go and calculate to see if you're on the average or above the average and you can tell NYU that. But the, but the idea is that in New York, you make more money in general, but you also spend more money, as you know, particularly through housing and other things that are space mediated. But this means that the GDP of large cities can be enormous, right? So when this was done, this is a while ago to 2005, as you can see here, the GDP of New York City, this is before Russia and all the stuff that we see now, was, was about the size of Russia's. So uh, you can go back and check the number now, but of course these are difficult times, but this is kind of an extraordinary result, right? So we wrote a paper about all this stuff and we're shocked that no one had done this sort of analysis. It's very simple. It's what the first thing you do in a physical system for a gas or a material or that you do in an ecosystem. But for cities, this reveals a bunch of things. That for example, uh, a lot of quantities that are sort of like this wages, once you take away population growth and economic growth nationwide, you get a self similar relationship that uh, that's basically expressing this agglomeration of scaling effects that wages are higher in larger cities by about a factor here of 12%, 11%. This is for GDP, which is a little bit different, but not too different. The fuzzy one is China, which is kind of special. The city sticking out there is Shenzhen, which is a big exporter of, uh, of electronics and so on, but it's a very similar effect. And this is over over many socioeconomic quantities. So what this started to reveal to us is that these effects are not purely economic as they had been thought by economists and some geographers, they're actually effects of interaction. So this is where the network comes in. And so, you know, we, there are maybe thousands of papers now, certainly hundreds, that explore various effects and so on. I'll touch back on this, but this has to do with many properties that basically can be summarized in a moment, but they have to do with many different urban systems, many different urban systems through time, different civilizations and so on, and that they tend to have these effects. These effects are essentially these effects that I'm showing you here in this slide. Socioeconomic networks on the right, this is GDP, tend to have the superlinear effect that uh, money per capita produced in a certain period of time goes up um, superlinearly with an effect about 10, 20%. Um, with every doubling. And on the left, an effect I haven't talked about much yet has to do essentially with the size of built spaces. So this is the surface of roads, but this is also true for the whole built area of cities, that these tend to be smaller per capita by about the same amount, the same about six 
10 to 20 percent, 15 percent, 16 percent. And so these effects are basically a spatial compression in a structured way that built environments have a certain structure and essentially a socioeconomic intensification and acceleration. So you can think about this as some sort of substance where things are coming together and they're speeding up and accelerating uh, because in terms of interactions and their products. So this is a rough picture. You shouldn't just take that as, uh, as what cities are. People have agency and they have feelings and they have things they want to do. But on the whole, that's sort of the effect that the environment, the, the broad environment the cities is producing. And then it's important to spend time thinking about what are these interactions? What do they mediate? Is it good? Is it bad? And so on. But basically, at this large scale, that's what you see. So I'm just going to flash a few examples. This is Europe. This is China. Uh, noisier data for reasons that we think we understand, but then a certain constancy over time. And the, re the way you can understand this, this phenomenon, it basically has to do with, uh, I'm just going to give you the simplest example, which you can do in one line. It's called the amorphous settlement model. This actually is realized in some archaeological settings where cities don't have roads and structure. They're just, as you see here, a smattering of houses over space. But the question becomes in this context, why does it have the scale? Why is it basically, you know, so if I put a radius there, just characteristic length, why isn't it, you know, denser or less dense, right? And and the reason is that it's sort of an argument that comes from geography and economics, but now it's adapted to a network picture rather than positing a utility or something, is that imagine that somebody living in one of these houses interacts with the other people. And if it goes around this, you have to do a bit more math than I'm showing you, it can show that the, the number of interactions over some period of time that one typically would have is proportional to the number of people and divided by the area. So it's basically proportional to the density uh, once you're done. So that's kind of a benefit. Presumably people are, want to interact with people, otherwise they wouldn't live like this. But then there's a cost, which is just the movement of moving, right? So if you have a subway system, it's a little bit different, but you still have a cost that's mediated by transportation. And in the simplest model, this is just proportional to the radius, so proportional to the size of the system, because you have to cross it to go to the center or to see a neighbor across town. So once you put these two things together, you basically get something like this, that the area now depends on the population of that little settlement, and the exponent is two thirds, and that the number of interactions and its products goes like this. It's basically the density times N, but the area has the signature. So this goes like four thirds. So this is exactly the symmetric uh, 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 effect that one thing is sub sublinear, the other one's superlinear. One is basically showing you a spatial compression. The other one shows you an intensification and speeding up of interactions with, with size. And this basically has the right flavor. Now to get the right, so this exponent is wrong. It's not what we observe in cities. What we observe in modern cities is smaller, as I showed you. And you have to work quite a lot harder to get there. So I'm not gonna show you, but basically it has to do with considering these things, uh, real hierarchical networks of transportation, uh, you know, putting social networks essentially in, in these spaces. And so where you basically imagine that, you know, what one does every day is to go around and have interactions. So when you go to a larger city, things change. So the house gets smaller, the, the infrastructure gets different. But basically what you have is more people in these spaces, more services, more organizations. And you can, with a similar effort in terms of at least of time, you can uh, have more interaction. So it's the same effect, but in a more structured way. And that means that you, you can start understanding that there's sort of a hierarchical but decentralized, it's kind of a subtle thing, but when you think of road networks, that's easy to think about. You don't have to go through Times Square to, to go to other parts of New York. It's a parallel system. You can go about many roads. You know that if you do studies of routing, but there's also hierarchy. If you want to go across town, you may want to take the subway or a highway. Uh, whereas if you are lo going locally, you can take local roads. So this kind of system, has a bunch of very predictable properties that tells you what the flow is on a large scale, what it should be on a small scale. It shows you there's a lot more um, um, sort of uh, congestion on the large scale because the flow needs to be faster and denser and so on. And this all comes together in terms of sort of a cost benefit analysis that all uh, um, uh, you know, squares away and makes a bunch of predictions and so on. So um, again, you have to work a little bit at this, but when you bring all this together, you start seeing basically that cities can, uh, as a structure, uh, create sort of a, a short-term spatial equilibrium where the cost of interaction, the cost of movement, and the structure infrastructure all come together to give you 
more or less what we see on average, but also predict a lot of the properties of things, including the shape of buildings, their height, the number of interactions, the number of COVID cases, because that's mediated by interactions and so on. So I'll show you some examples of that, but it's just a relatively simple theory in essence, but that allows you to start thinking about what a city does. So these are sort of the logic of how it works, but again, I'm not gonna go into that. And these are just applications. These are kind of the Aztecs, can you believe it? So they had, when we did this, my colleague Scott Ortman just said, you know, the stuff you're, you're writing in this paper about cities, it's not about cities. I said, what do you mean? It's about networks and, you know, it's not about modern cities at all. You know, you're just saying that people interact, built spaces have a certain structure. I have cities in archeology span that are like that. So let's try it. So basically what you see here are proxies for both built spaces. And then in this case, um, productivity in the construction of monuments, but we've done a lot of this now that has somewhat similar properties, but um, in a different context with different technology, different political systems and so on. Okay, so there are many things that can be gotten to this at the aggregate average scale of cities, right? So um, many of them are really important, like energy consumption in buildings with different shapes or um, COVID cases, or uh, we have a recent paper on mental health. It had been known by psychologists that depression in particular is mediated by some people's social networks. People that are very isolated tend to express higher rates of depression. So to the extent that on a big average over the entire metropolitan area of New York, people tend to have more interactions in New York than in a smaller city, this has a signature that's kind of interesting. There are other signatures at the neighborhood scale that are more specific and more familiar, but there are a lot of things like this that are important. So this starts allowing us to put together what cities are. Okay, and, and then you can go in the directions between cities and these have to do with process of growth. Uh, they are stochastic, but these can also be understood. It turns out this is sort of a, a model for global equilibrium between a system of cities with certain flows between them where sort of these laws of geography that are familiar that Mike might've talked about come out of the wash as well. So these are actually quite predictable as well. And their deviations are meaningful in terms of preferential patterns of migration, for example, that people may express. Okay, so what I want to, you to remember from this part is that, you know, uh, there are a lot of details I didn't talk about, but we have sort of uh, an emerging quantitative predictive urban theory that depends on heterogeneous learning agents, which are more sophisticated than we've had so far in social sciences, and that part is still developing in some, in some aspect. And then we have uh, theories of, and, and a lot of observations now of local sorting and adaptation at the local scale within cities that allows us to understand neighborhood effects and their effects back on people. I'll tell you a little bit about this uh, in the applications. And then we have what I spent a little bit of time describing, network effects in denser socioeconomic networks. In some sense, this is what cities do. This is sort of the intermediate state scale that cities are put together. Uh, and these exist over self-consistent built environments so that they allow something like New York Metro to exist and other cities to exist. Um, and then at higher scales, we have issues of urban hierarchy of energy and information. This is a little bit underexplored, but this is what is very important in terms of carbon emissions and sustainability. So this will play a very important role if cities become circular economies, the urban system will be very different. So this is very important to understand. And then all this is connected by typically exponential growth dynamics that ge generate these, these log statistics like Ziff's law and log normal uh, distributions of income. And these are driven by information, by learning that's happening across all these scales, but particularly individual scale mediated by the city. So these are fast scales and slow scales, small scales and large scales, but all these kind of have to be knit together to understand what cities do. All right, now let me talk about these, these two applications. So uh, I'm going to go uh, somewhat quickly uh, through this first one because there's a lot, but this is really, really about neighborhoods and neighborhood scale as a scale where inequality is mostly expressed as place-based um, inequality. It's also a scale of political organization and human development. So the second part will be about that. And if you look at a place like New York, I'm just focusing here in Manhattan, you have neighborhoods where people have radically different, for example, income distributions. These are three examples. But you also see this uh, plot here on the bottom, it's not very well plotted, but basically there's a, a nice log normal distribution of income for the whole metro area. So the whole metro area looks simple, but of course each neighborhood is very different. And so these two things must be compatible. And so the way they're understood, obviously you know that because you probably live in New York and have fine housing, that uh, people sort themselves in this case by income, but also by race, by education, many other ways. 
Um, and, and this creates this very complex structure of cities. So there's a way to understand this, but also it's a general phenomenon that we see in cities anywhere. And of course, there are aspects like race that play out differently in different contexts, but nevertheless, there are neighborhoods and sorting in almost any city. And so what I'm about to tell you is about how do we understand neighborhoods of cities that are just forming. And this is work I've done with a big NGO called Slum Dwellers International that basically measure slum neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are very poor, that often don't have services. And we started by doing these massive surveys where we did it for tens of thousands of neighborhoods that expose many of the issues of these neighborhoods, but that essentially force you to think about planning from the a local, from a bottom-up perspective. So this is a quote from one of their uh, founders in terms of the problems of planning for fragile neighborhoods. Many people have written about this. This is from the perspective of a community organizer. Okay, so it works like it's a beautiful thing now because we have geospatial information that is allowing people to become planners. So you can have a world where uh, analytics and planning is sort of in the hands of residents, which of course can bring you a lot more information to the process and a lot of objectives, but also creates sort of a collective coordination organization uh, problem that, you know, how these people organize with the city and the back and forth that results. But this is happening everywhere, particularly in Africa and India, because of technology, but also because of need, right? So there are all kinds of things you can measure. These are points and services and so on. And you see that these are very dispersed. This is a big neighborhood in Kenya and it's all mapped neighborhood building by building. And it's the kind of thing we've been measuring in terms of services that are present or not. The biggest problem in many of these neighborhoods is sanitation because it's the heaviest infrastructure. But these neighborhoods also people use very little energy. So there's a lot of scope for intervening in terms of better construction, better networks of sanitation, but also starting to think about people having more access to energy and all that that entails in a way that's sustainable. So all that needs to be done quickly. Okay, and when these services come in, this is a study for Brazil, uh, they tend to actually come in very unequally. So I'm not going to elaborate on this on this uh, uh, on this plot, but basically showing you that when services come in, they're very patchy in the city. Some neighborhoods get it and some neighborhoods don't until later on, most neighborhoods get everything, which is this convergence to one here. So when you look at one of these neighborhoods, what you tend to see is this, that the thing that the city delivers are on the outskirts, on the roads that exist, like you know toilets and water points, but what the community does itself and organizes itself is in the middle. So what you see there is the temple slash bar, which is basically where the community meets. So this is this is not a city, right? In the way we've come to expect it. We expect a city like New York or Chicago to have services that come into each home. Each home has an address. It can be serviced by emergency services and so on. And so this is not a city in the sense of what I was describing to you in terms of how infrastructure and the built environment works. This is a city, hopefully in formation, where these two networks need to come together still. And so this can be analyzed not only this way, but in a way that's mathy, right? That's mathematical and analytical. So I'm just going to drive you through a little bit of that problem. We came from many visits to many neighborhoods and observing what communities and cities do, which is a process called reblocking, which is creating a street network that comes to every house or sometimes reorganizing the houses such that that can happen. Okay, and this is, I'm gonna flash through this quickly, but it's a nice problem. It's where topology was born. This is Euler's problem about the seven bridges of Konigsberg and so on, which is to create a network. Instead of dealing with the geometry of actual physical space, what you want is to deal with a space of relationships. So topological relationships, which of course give you networks and graphs. And uh, I'm gonna go quickly, but this allows you to then start uh, looking at, these are different city blocks, so this is the essence of what we do. Uh, the very blocky one is Hell's Kitchen, so it's New York City, you can kind of see, it could be Chicago, it's New York City. And sort of on the right, you got Harare, which is a neighborhood that's informal and has these internal parcels, you see there in red and the D. These are basically um, uh, places where there are houses, where people don't have access to the street and therefore they have no chance of having sanitation or, or other services. Sometimes electricity comes in a wire and it's easier. But this you can measure basically by doing a, a graphical procedure that analyzes the structure of relationships as a graph that you see here at the bottom that allows you to identify uh, graph in, in a graphical algorithmic way internal parcels. And so once you can do this, you can take this to very complicated situations. So this is doing a, a whole region of Harare where you can start classifying which blocks have um, more levels of internal parcels. In this case, the uh, yellow and red ones have five, four layers, 
And then you can take this to even larger scale. So this is work that uh, I can send you the slides, you can see this, but we're now taking to scale. So we just obtained a data set for all the building footprints in sub-Saharan Africa. This has been generated by Maxar Technologies. Same people are giving you those photos from, uh, from the Ukraine. Uh, we now have sub you know, basically 20 cent 24 centimeter resolution images. Uh, there's a lot of AI in terms of extracting features and we get data sets at the other end that have this kind of information. So we have you know, many hundreds of millions of footprints where you can start uh, doing this sort of analysis. And so what we're doing here is basically to create a data set where the world is understood city block by city block and each city block has certain characteristics. And this allows us to uh, decompose a complicated problem into a problem where solutions could be more local and more organic, but also where there are categories of how difficult different places are. So what you're seeing here is Sierra Leone and sort of the spatial decomposition. And it looks a little bit like this. This is one of those neighborhoods, Kruge. And you see that when you look at this and you've traveled, you've been in environments like this, this is a mixed neighborhood. It's not completely informal, it's quite informal, but it has some streets and paths and so on that go on like the one here that people are on. And so there's a question about how not to totally destroy this, to create a neighborhood that's organic and good. So, but at the same time to deliver services and create development. So that's not a poverty trap. And the idea is that uh, in some sense to understand how to do that, you have to understand the process of urban development. The kind of things that we see, for example, in Europe in a nice neighborhood where we would like to have coffee today that happened over hundreds of years. We need, if we have urban science that's worth its salt, we should be able to understand what that process is and accelerate it in a way that in a generation, a few decades, maybe, or even a few years on the basics of interventions, you could do that. This is sort of a dream that goes back to early planning and that's been around for a long time, but that the data and the information, the knowledge that we have now starting to allow us to do from the bottom up, but also from the top down in a way that's sort of organic and that has all these constraints, including local knowledge. So I'm just gonna flash a few of these complicated neighborhoods. So this is one you saw in the previous slide. Uh, in Sierra Leone, it's on a hill. And so all this stuff that I hope you can see there are buildings. And so you see basically that what we do is to identify, put a graph on this and identify the internal blocks and see how many layers there are. And this is our measure of complexity. And then uh, we can propose street networks that would solve the problem as well as other things. And then we can superpose population maps that exist worldwide and see how many people live estimates, how many people live in situations that are sort of remedial that you could easily just extend the access network and service a lot of people, which are these ones in purple, and which how many people live in these very complicated neighborhoods that need uh, bigger interventions and reblocking and so on, which are more in the yellow category. So you can see there is a typology here of problems. A lot of these yellow neighborhoods actually are, um, so this is a bigger um, uh, Freetown area. And what you can see here, is there a lot of the blocks that kind of are quite yellow, they're actually not very dense. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to create a street network without going into a situation where you, you run out of space and you cannot um, improve the situation. And a lot of these cities, particularly in West Africa, they may have a population growth till the end of the century of about four times what they are today. So they need to somehow have a model that allows them to uh, progress quickly and provide sort of sustainable development um, in working with what is there. So, yeah, and you can create sort of these cadastral maps as you go. This is very controversial because obviously uh, it deals with property and so on, but all this stuff is created in the process. So I'm just gonna flash this then. We, we would seek collaborators to do this. We're about to release a map uh, of, of the world of Sub-Saharan Africa, but also we've done this in a previous version using open street maps that basically divides the world into city blocks and each city block has a bunch of characteristics. And so um, this has many implications for, for all kinds of things that I'm showing you here. And we seek collaborations for other things that could be done. Okay, so the application number two is related to this one, but it's in a different context. It has to do with this idea of human development. It kind of is teasing this idea of measuring sustainable development goals, which New York City is now doing, aligned which is with its one New York City sort of program. But it's been observed before that uh, measures of human development, which are basically measures of real incomes, education, life expectancy, and health, uh, they tend to be associated with larger cities. Larger cities actually, despite all their problems, tend to do better than, uh, than smaller places and rural places. And so this is a study that UN Habitat had done a while and uh, it's sort of an, est an early estimate of how well large cities do in orange relative to their nation, which is in blue. So you see, for example, in India in particular, there's a big gap. 
even though if you've been to an Indian city, it may not look to you like that. It still apparently makes a big difference compared to other parts of India. Okay, so we've done this now for the United States based on another extraordinary data set released a few years ago of life expectancy at the neighborhood level. And I think you've been seeing uh, papers and newspaper articles and so forth about that. What we've done is to use that along with measures of real income and education to measure the human development index. Uh, which is this venerable index by which nations have been ranked worldwide. The United States is now number 17, so we're not doing so well. You see the, the rankings here. And it's probably because the United States has not been doing very well with education or health to the general population. So this is kind of interesting and topical. But the point is that when you measure this across skills, it's very different, right? And you start seeing basically that there's a lot of inequality that's place-based in terms of human development. So this is Chicago. And there are some places in Chicago that are better than Norway, the best country on the list of countries. But there are also many parts of Chicago that when you compare it to a nation look like China or, 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 or Mexico, which is somewhat relevant in terms of patterns of migration. So this allows you to start to see sort of patterns of inequality of something that's been argued to be fundamental. And this is kind of, you can read the paper, the link is, is down there. But basically the idea here is that when you measure this for larger cities in the United States, they tend to have higher levels of human development, but they also have a lot more inequality across their neighborhoods. So these two things come together and sort of, you can rank these things and see uh, cities and so forth. You imagine what are the places that typically have highest human development, even within large cities. And the answer in a nutshell is basically college towns. They're basically places like uh, it, within New York, you can look, for example, at the area in Manhattan, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, around NYU, and that's an area with very high human development. It has good incomes, not extraordinarily high, but good, and it has high education, of course, but also life expectancy. So college towns have a halo effect. There are a lot of people with those characteristics like to live nearby. So if that's the future of human development, that's more or less what it looks like if you trust the space, this data. And what you can do is that at the neighborhood scale, this is a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna go into detailed statistics, but what you have is that basically uh, a lot of the problems of, of people kind of are correlated with this, with this metric and they go away at high human development. Okay, so this is my final slide. And it's really, I want to convince you that we have extraordinary new data. We have new frameworks to think about cities that are more predictive and that allow us to think about the future, but also issues of development and equity in new ways. And I just want to say one last thing. So I'm very excited about New York City, all the things that go into the sustainable development plan for the city, but also this new initiative about the Climate Solutions Center in Governors Island. I think you guys may be involved a little bit with NYU with this. It's been driven by other organizations. I hope this is done well, because it could be amazing. Um, I hope it's not, you know, a small little thing, but but it could be extraordinary. And New York City is really a place of leadership in understanding cities, but also hopefully in policy. Okay, so with that, I'll finish there. And um, I went a little bit over, right, Jackie? I'm sorry. That's um, totally fine. We really enjoyed this talk. I'm sure everyone appreciated everything you had to say. And we do, we do have to end five minutes early today due to some people's time constraints. So I just we'll have about five six minutes now for Q&A. So let's just try and ask our questions efficiently and quickly. So let's see, I'll call on, and does anybody have a question? If you have one, just feel free to speak up and start talking. Yeah, Yuri, yeah. Hi. Yeah, Yuri, how you doing, Luis? Good to see you again. Hey, uh, I got a question for you. You know, in um, all kinds of wave theory, you use uh, uh, methods that disrupt the system and look to see how it settles back. So if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, what can you learn from that? that you can't learn from these sort of semi-static studies. I know uh, I kind of threw a bomb over. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to. I was mm -hmm. just wondering. Yeah, I mean, the Ukraine is very hard. I, 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 I can't think straight about it. Um, I, you know, it's, uh, it's just awful. Just the, the wholesale destruction. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, I think that obviously you see that it, it's very hard, we know this from Baghdad and other places, it's very hard for, for to occupy a large modern city. And so I think the Russians uh, deciding to destroy as they have done in Grozny and parts of Syria. So they've destroyed the city. And there's only one thing through history that can, uh, you know, uh, yeah. the, create the demise of a city and that's total destruction. Um, it's probably true that the social, you know, I, I remember a conversation I had with, with Fujita of, of Fujita Venables and Krugman 
uh, about Tokyo. He grew up in basically post firebombed Tokyo. And he said, you know, it's amazing how Tokyo is the largest city in the world and how rich it is and so forth. And he said, you know, it's a very interesting problem. And I think the reason why we came back so strong is that we had us, we had the social network. The social network was still there and could reconstitute the built environment in a new way that created an extraordinary new city. But the built environment was destroyed. So the question, it depends on the resilience of any city. Ultimately, I mean, this is totally extreme cases, is totally predicated on on its people and and their socioeconomic interactions, being able to remember that city and rebuild it into the future. Uh, But we don't know what is going to happen in Ukraine. At the same time, you know, people are fighting back. And so it's very hard to occupy a city because, (laughs) as you know, cities are hard to govern in good times and in bad times. Uh, To your other question, we we have looked, so we've looked now carefully in various ways at measures of cost of living. There are several ways to measure it, but cost of living rises just the same as wages and GDP. So basically it's super linear in the same way, which means that the real costs of living are neutral between large cities and, and small cities. What you get is what you get that's different. So you can go to the opera, you can go to a hospital with a brain surgeon, you can attend a nice lecture, whatever it is, uh, you can get the newest ideas or go to Wall Street. But the fact is you don't get richer on the average by living in a larger city. Thanks. Great. Um, Do we have any other questions? People can either raise their hand or just start speaking or put it in the chat, whatever they feel more comfortable with. And I have a question. Um, thank you so much. Very exciting talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. I, I'm just wondering a little bit about the connection between the two big pieces of support that you presented, right? Like when look at, looking at uh, uh, neighborhoods in development, right? Like, uh, like you have slums in Africa and Latin America mm-hmm. and compared to larger urban areas where they, they exist. Um, is there, uh, have you, have you seen that those curves uh, of cost benefit effects, you know, across multiple factors, are they significantly different for uh, people in those neighborhoods that they are for the larger uh, group of people in the city? And Yes. I mean, most, the biggest single cost is housing. So you can, you know, you can, I'm sure you guys have data about housing in New York. I think I've seen some work from, from CUSP and others at NYU. So, you know, it's housing can be super different. I mean, it's always expensive, <laughs> but it can be quite different in different neighborhoods for, for reasons that are more or less obvious. Um, when you go to a slum, of course, the cost of housing, if the cost is even ill-defined in many ways, I mean, but in some ways it is economic cost, places are rented and so on. Um, it can be much cheaper, but obviously you're paying for it with the benefit, if you will, is lower because you don't have services and you live in precarious situations and so on. So, but this is one of the main ways. So in, in modern cities where there are fewer restrictions, at least in terms of policy, in terms of redlining or something explicitly separating people or ghettos and so forth, a lot of the sorting that we see spatially is mediated through real estate and real estate possibilities because that's the main single cost. So when people live in a neighborhood that tends to be cheaper, they pay a price in transportation or in poor environmental quality or poor services and so on. There are a lot of studies all over cities. In Chicago, this is kind of a lot of studies like that. So that cost benefit may allow people to live in a city for a little while, maybe get a foothold on the city, but the question then becomes over time in terms of development over time, are they paying a price that's kind of creates a, either poverty trap or an irreversible situation? And it's likely to, but then that's a somewhat a question that has a different time scale, right? And, and it plays on to issues of equity. But unless you put those scales together, right, you will, you will see this adaptation as, as inevitable, but you pay the price over time. And in your, in your partnership, uh, in the context of this project or others, ha, has right. this been an argument that, that you could use at the level of incentivizing investment in these areas, you know, by like central governments in the cities or like, like national government? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know that, I mean, in any city, in any country, it's, it's better to have a healthy, educated population and that pays off in the long run. But in the short run, you know, the question is who gets the benefit, so to speak, of that, of those of those interventions. And the answer is that private actors, even city governments may not be able to necessarily collect the benefits because people will grow up and they'll may go somewhere else and et cetera, and it takes time. So almost always the role of governments to mediate that 
and and governments even like in development contexts i mentioned briefly uh, cadastral maps but even simple things like delivering services there's simple things that are not so simple uh you know most governments that do deliver services often don't have the billing infrastructure or the property maps and the property taxes that would allow them in a traditional model like we have in the united states for example to recover the costs of providing that service so that loop that's institutional as well as spatial as well as infrastructural is not closed and so it's not hard to imagine how to close it but you have to bring all these things together all at once otherwise you spend money creating the service but then you cannot recoup the cost so that you cannot service all the neighborhoods from the point of view of government but then from the point of view of city of, of individual settling they don't get services they don't get civic rights and so on so so you have to close that loop but also manifest i think we can do that better now with better data better information manifest that this creates a benefit as well as a cost that pays out to the city and the government that can be recouped and enrolled as a continued investment over time because often the governments cannot make that case or politicians have very short time frames and so on it doesn't get done great thank you so much i appreciate it you're welcome pleasure <laughs> So fascinating. So well, we'll have to stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Bentoncourt. I want to also just second what everyone else is saying. This was a great presentation. I just really appreciate how you make these complex systems so concrete and how you're explaining what's going on. It's wonderful. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everybody. It's always good to see you guys. You. And I hope to be in touch. You know, we're all busy, but yes, we uh, sometime I'll be in New York. And if you guys are in Chicago, don't be strangers. Come and see us. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye.